But again, one of the other big things I learned through my students was that when a process isn't working, don't throw out the whole process. Like go back through it step by step, figure out where it's not working and fix that component. And that has been incredibly helpful for me and for my students because everything we try will have some piece that isn't perfect. And if we just throw it out when it doesn't work, we'll never end up with something that works. ADHD Rewired, episode 180. This is the show designed for those of us with really good intentions, but a slightly wandering attention. My name is Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, coach, and speaker. The website is ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. But first, let me tell you about this. Hey, everyone. If you're new to the podcast, I want to welcome you. ADHD Rewired is a podcast where you will hear real conversations with people just like yourself, as well as with therapists and coaches and doctors who are here to share their stories and their struggles, as well as some of the best science and most innovative strategies out there. On ADHD Rewired, I believe in the importance of providing you with what the science really says on ADHD by sharing with listeners reliable, evidence-based information. If anything you hear on this podcast that doesn't have a strong research basis, that will be clearly stated because not all research is created equally. But ADHD Rewired is definitely more than just a podcast. We are a community. We have a live Q&As every month. We have a free group on Facebook, which is set up as a secret group. So nobody on Facebook has to know that you're in a group. And ADHD Rewired also provides intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. The website where you can learn more about the podcast, about the community, about our coaching groups is ADHDrewired.com. Each episode has a show notes page with timestamps of what we talked about and links to anything that we mentioned on the show. And while you're there, sign up for my free email newsletter and don't forget to hit subscribe on whichever podcast app you use so you can get new episodes each week. And as always, if you like the show, let us know by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you love what we're doing, become a monthly contributor over at patreon.com slash ADHD Rewired. Your monthly financial contribution is super helpful in supporting the mission here. And you can get cool perks starting at any level, including check out the first episode of the Gibson and Eric show. This is a podcast. The first episode is about 20 minutes long with me and my six year old son. And uh, I think you will love it. Thanks for tuning in and enjoy today's episode. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. If you are new to the podcast, I want to welcome you uh, to ADHD Rewired. We are more than just a podcast. We are a community. And today we are welcoming back. It's been about a year, I think, uh, since today's guest was last on is we have Joe, I was going to do your your rhymes with words, your Joe Rebecca Hellifino, which was the last part of your word. Uh, Joe <laughs> Melica, what do we say? Um, exploit, no, Deloitte, Detroit, Detroit. Voight. Let's try I that. I just confused everybody. Like, who you, who's on? Who, who are you? You want me to announce myself? Please. On today's podcast, we're welcoming <laughs> Joe Meleka Voight. That was good. You you, you, you like got a thing for podcasting, I think. I got a face for podcasting. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Joe was on uh, about a year ago. When you were on, you were just recently diagnosed with ADHD. Uh, Joe is a teacher, a acclimated, is that a word, acclimated teacher? A teacher with acclimates? Accolades. Accolades. Not, English, English is my first language, but you wouldn't know it. It's all good. It's all good. Words are hard. I know, right? 
It's, it's, it's a good thing I don't need them for my work. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, a, 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 um, a really very well respected teacher. I think you were nominated like the best teacher in the state. Is that? No, that is not correct. <laughs> not in correct. the country, in the yeah. world. Yeah. In the universe, the galaxy. No, I, I'm a, I'm a good teacher. How's that? She's also very humble. Mm-hmm. And um, when we first spoke, I think it was like you just started taking medication. Like the day I before, it, I think maybe. Yeah, I think I'd been diagnosed like a month or two beforehand. And then uh, we spoke in increments. We talked a couple, two, three times um, along the way. So, yeah. Yeah, and I know that uh, this past year has been uh, pretty eventful for you. You've had some, uh, some health issues. You've been doing uh, training for some a marathon or a 10K or something. Uh, I was training for a half marathon, but the health issues stood in the way of that. So, and a triathlon. And basically right now I just want to run. So however, however far my body takes me. I'll however go. far your body takes you. So you, you do like to push yourself. And other people. And other people. <laughs> so how in the last year, tell me what has like, how is, how was your school year? Um, uh, how, give me, give us a, a sort of a snapshot of uh, a year in review for, for you since your diagnosis. I am not exaggerating. I might not even be expressing it enough when I say it was life changing and career changing. One of the biggest difficulties with me being diagnosed was I had been teaching for uh, 18 years and I'm married to a special ed teacher. How did I not know that I have ADHD? And I realized that it was because I didn't know ADHD. I thought I understood what it was. I thought I understood who had it and what it looked like. Mm-hmm. And so in terms of being an educator, uh, it changed my view completely around who might have ADHD and what that looks like and what to do to help them. And that it isn't just um, an attention issue. It's emotional, social. There's just so many aspects to it. And I learned so much from my students who have ADHD that it's overwhelming. It's absolutely overwhelming. So on an On a professional level, it it was changing. It was one of the most difficult years of my life because of health, because of being in two different schools, which was difficult for me. Um, But it was also the most rewarding year of my career. It was amazing. It was amazing. Can you um, share with us any uh, maybe uh, specific stories that that kind of jump out to you uh, that were... Uh, notably different as a result of uh, of having this diagnosis and sort of what you did with that? So I thought a lot about how I wanted to, to be, how open I wanted to be about it at work. Working with educators, uh, you would think, well, you know, we get it, right? So if someone says we have uh, some sort of disability, that's what we do, so we get it. But I also recognize the fact that as an educator, I didn't get it. Mm-hmm. So I was very um, careful about how to present it, but I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to hide it. Is it really, you and I spoke about a year ago, the similarity between this and coming, realizing I'm gay Mm -hmm. and those two things being like this coming out process. And Mm -hmm. I found being open about being gay and out was not only helpful to me to be authentic and be myself, it was helpful to people around me to learn, to understand. So I knew that I wanted to go that way, but I wanted to figure out how to approach this. So I did speak to my principals and people in the district and everybody was fantastic about it. Incredibly supportive and uh, helpful being in two different schools. And I expressed concern about, you know, time management and, and organization and all that stuff. And they were just like, whatever you need. I mean, it was great. They were fantastic. I ended up being quite successful with those challenges, but I think it was because they gave me that confidence. But the bigger thing was that uh, one of the principals encouraged me as we were talking to maybe uh, work with kids who have ADHD and see um, how we could share together. So we started a group of of, uh, kids who would just come together once a week and talk to each other. We would watch uh, videos about different things, talk about different strategies, try to help each other with strategies. Uh, make things to help. It it was just a really great learning experience for Mm -hmm. everyone. But those kids at the end, the biggest thing they shared with me was 
they thought they were alone. They thought they were the only ones with ADHD. They did it. They were sitting in classes with these other kids who had ADHD and they had no idea. And the ability to relate and find their tribe and to, to it, it, their results in school went up exponentially. Like it was amazing. It was amazing. And one girl in particular. So this, that was my long way of getting to the story I really wanted to share. And I just want to share before you tell about this one girl that when you, when you said that the students, they shared with you how the impact of, of feeling like they're not alone Full, mm-hmm. full body goosebumps it gave me. So I want you to know that and the impact of that. And uh, it's, that's awesome, Joe. That's awesome. Well, I mean, I, I also did a few professional development uh, with my colleagues in the school, just explaining to them, this is what ADHD is. This is how I know. And this is what I'm doing with these kids and had other adults share with me their experiences. And so I wasn't alone anymore either. Isn't that and nice? Yeah, it just felt like, you know, breaking that stigma. It's we always work better yes. in it together than yes. alone. Yes. And uh I can't advocate enough for people being out and open when it's safe to do so. Like obviously you don't want someone to to lose a job, even though it's not legal. Right. We know it can happen. Yeah, we know it happens. We Absolutely. Family, whatever. I mean, it has to be safe for you or at least safe enough of a risk for you to take. Absolutely. I, I can't advocate. I know what, one of my favorite uh, parts of uh, presenting to, to groups of teachers is the, the inevitable uh, thing that happens at the after my presentation is I'll have a handful of teachers come up to me and go, oh, that's what ADHD is. I think I have ADHD and it's, and which is awesome because now this teacher is going to see it in a new light and will, that will impact uh, students in an even more positive way. Uh, hopefully. So the ripple effect. yeah, the Talk ripple effect. The ripple. Absolutely. Yes. It's uh, the, the people who, you know, even those kids, like if we look at what they're going to do, and we're talking 13, 14 year old kids. So, you know, 10, 15 years from now, what ripple effect will they have? That, you bet. You bet. I mean, it doesn't matter if they remember who I am. It's about what impact will they have when, yeah, I can't advocate for it enough. So, so um, the, uh, the story about the girl you were, were going to mention. So I had a young lady who uh, I teach kids for two years in a row, mostly, mostly I have them in seventh grade and then I follow them up to eighth grade. And so I have the opportunity to really get to know them. And uh, last year was a very challenging year with my seventh graders, Uh, not this past year, the year before. And uh, what I ended up finding out in eighth grade was that a lot of them have ADHD and I didn't get it. And then once I did, we ended up having a great year. So this one young lady in particular, very, very bright young lady, very responsible, very like one of those kids that doesn't raise your flags anywhere right now, Mm -hmm. but very um, anxious, very, you know, asking questions before you get to it, very interrupting and, and just really, because you could almost see the I, I need to ask now or I'll forget. I need to, I need to know what you what's happening next. So I know what's relevant to remember. Like I could almost see myself in her as mm-hmm. a kid. I took her aside and I shared with her about uh, a time that a, 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 an assistant principal had called me out about asking a lot of questions in staff meetings. And she goes, really? I said, yeah. And I told her about my diagnosis and she said, you know, my mom has wondered about that for me. Mm. So I uh, called mom and her mom said to me, thank you. I have been telling people since she was in third grade that there is something not right. And everyone keeps saying she's doing fine. Her grades are good. You know, she got diagnosed. Um, she chose to medicate and her life changed. And those, her, her parents have been, her mother can't be happier and more thrilled with the fact that her daughter got noticed and seen and didn't fall through the cracks. Cause I think at some point it catches up even with the most brilliant of us, right. That at some point and her anxiety got better and she was able to play sports in a different way and just became, it was a great experience. Felt like what I had hoped someone had done for me happened for this young lady. And so it was great. And when I was out sick, I, I got very sick at the end of the year and I was out for about two months. Uh, these kids in this ADHD group with this young girl and some of the other kids, they were messaging me all the time and checking on me and sending me cards. And just because they 
related with someone who they saw themselves in. They saw someone successful who was able to help them and recognize their strengths and their needs and advocate for them. And I think I'm hoping it's changing their paths. So. Mm. But let me ask you this. So being an advocate, being, being a champion really for, uh, for students, how has that changed you? Or what has that done for you? Oh, I don't even know how to put that into words. You know, when you and I spoke last year, I was kind of going through the phases of acceptance and mm. the ultimate realization I made through all that was that I'm enough. And that, that resonates with me that, that I'm enough that, that, uh, I don't have to be what everyone else is or what everyone else claims I'm enough as I am. And I think that seeing them recognize that younger has been it's healing for me. You know, it helps me. It's not just about helping them. You know, like I like to say, like, oh yeah, they'll have this great future and that's all that matters. It does matter, but, and it is the big reason, but just to see and have that hope and that knowledge that they can pull on each other or on their own strengths or know that at some point, if things are starting to get to spin that they can say, wait a second, I, maybe it's time to reevaluate or, you know what I mean? Just to mm -hmm. even have that strength, uh, it gives me strength. It helps me to do those same things. And, uh, you know, through a difficult several months of my life that carries you through. So it means mm -hmm. the world. Yeah. I was diagnosed when I was 19. Um, I know that you were, you were older than that. There is something that is really, uh, healing about helping those younger than, than, uh, ourselves, um, that, uh, who, you know, would have the potential to really go through a lot of the same struggles without this information. And, mm -hmm. uh, it's a really uh, extraordinary, uh, um, opportunity, ability, uh, experience to, to be able to, you know, connect with people who have ADHD, who, um, and, and help them feel understood. I mean, that's, I truly believe that there is no greater um, uh, thing that's important in the realm of ADHD as in, as our relationship with ourselves and our understanding our ADHD mm -hmm. and our relationship with others and how they understand you know our uh, the the how we are in the world and understand it through a an accurate lens and not a judgmental lens is I don't know it's critical. It's, uh, well, especially for ourselves, mm -hmm. right? Because um, actually everything you're saying brings up that uh, a story that I had started to tell you uh, previously about how I viewed myself as a kid. And so a lot of helping these kids and helping them to start to discover and unravel and just given permission, if anything, to uh, know that it's that. ADHD is not just something it's your brain. It, it's everything that controls you. Right. And so emotionally and all these things that we might not, you know, even I think people who were diagnosed younger, who are in our, my age category, I know you're several years younger than I am, but who were diagnosed younger, uh, I still think weren't given for the most part, a lot of the understanding of what parts of their lives ADHD might influence in terms of their emotional state or their mm -hmm. social relationships, you know, job security, things like that. I, I don't, there wasn't a lot of that knowledge there. So I think helping them to be able to go back and get that. But the, I realized that as a kid through a very tragic experience that I've had or two, that I didn't under I blamed myself for a lot more than I um, than was reasonable for a young kid to blame themselves for not knowing or not being able to work with or be diagnosed. And so um, there's a lot of healing that goes on with being able to help kids. I don't it's gonna get really emotional here. So we, we can do emotion here unless you you want to uh... <laughs> what, what's going on? Um, I had a, uh, a recent, um, person in my life who, uh, committed suicide, um, uh, very recently in the past week. 
Um, and that's, it's, diff, it's very, there's just so much that goes with it, right? And uh, given the difficulty I've already had. And so in thinking about it, um, it actually gave me a, a big uh, realization about my youth. And um, when I was younger and I was in elementary school, I used to tell my mother, don't go to parent-teacher conferences because I know what they're going to tell you already. I talk too much. I can't stay sit in my seat. I rush through my work. I could do so much better if I tried harder. I know already. Mm. She's like, well, if you know, how come you don't fix it? And I was like, because I don't, I try. And, you know, I just didn't get it, right? And so I, I, so there's that that kind of beats on you constantly. Like, you know, you know what's wrong with you. Just fix it. And um Right, because like ADHD is we know what to do, but we don't do what we know. So it's right, right. Well, if you don't even know you have it, then, well, of course, right? you're a kid. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And you know, and other kids are cruel, and you're they're like, just shut up, will you? You know, so stop talking to me. I got to pay attention. I'm getting in trouble. Yeah, my mom doesn't want me sitting next to you. I mean, there's it it, it wreaks havoc on your mm. on your mm. self worth. So I often tell the story that something happened in fifth grade. And I thought maybe it was puberty that. Um, suddenly that changed. I went from being that kid who couldn't stay seated, the kid who couldn't stop talking, the kid. Who, I went from that to the kid who just sat in her seat and daydreamed, at least what it seemed like on the outside. You know, my mm -hmm. grades started to suffer. I recognized myself that I became the student throughout the rest of my school career, really, who, while I wasn't physically hyperactive, I was mentally hyperactive. So my, my, thoughts were everywhere. I, you know, I was coming up with stories and imagining, I mean, my brain was everywhere except mm -hmm. on what I was supposed to be focusing on. And what I recognized through this grieving process was that my fourth grade teacher committed suicide. And mm. she did that um, during a school break. My recollection was we were not allowed to grieve that. Not, it wasn't an open conversation. My record, I mean, I was in fourth grade. Did, I don't did the, did, did, the, all and the kids knew what happened. We were not told what happened, but you know, there was talk among the adults that we overheard and that oh. you know, was, it was not handled in a way that I think it, it would definitely wouldn't handle it nowadays this way. Let's put it that way. You know, I think genuinely believe people were trying to protect us. I, I don't think there was a bad intention, but the, result of that was a kid who already blamed herself for lots of stuff and was down on herself saying, I, you know, I wonder if, if I frustrated her too much, you know, I never outright said that. I never came right out and said that I never, but in the back of my head, I think there was always this, I wish I had behaved better for her. I wish I had been a better student or whatever. And I think I internalized that and the hyperactivity became so that other people wouldn't internalize yeah. right yeah. it's um first of all joe i'm sorry for for that loss your most recent loss yeah. and while you probably do know this i do want to say that the, the loss of your fourth grade teacher is not your fault in any way shape or form at all i know that i really really do and i thank you for that and i think it's important to make clear that as I understand too that kids don't always understand what they're feeling, right? right? And so as a kid, I don't I don't think I really was like thinking that I was responsible for it. I think it was just this this sense of of I wish I could have been better. I wish I could have done things differently. I wish why couldn't I just make her life happy? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like just these it's it's not even something that you're thinking it, out loud. It, it almost it's sounds like you were sort of like got stuck in this bargaining phase of of grief, where it's mm -hmm. where it's like, oh, if I would have done this better, or if I if I would have only, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's and I think it's uh, you know, you, you made the comments about uh, you know, kids don't really know what they're feeling. I think that's the grown-ups' fault in a lot of ways because I think mm -hmm. if we did a better job of of emotional education. Um, Absolutely. kids would be really good at understanding what they're feeling. And then maybe we can actually uh, raise it, uh, our next generation of leaders in this world that aren't crazy. It would be great to do sooner rather than later, right. but this whole well, notion of like pushing feelings down and, you know, it just, it's, 
unhealthy. And I, I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you said that because you're right. Because we started out this whole thing talking about helping kids gain awareness in their ADHD and their journey and their experience and being able to connect and understand. So yeah, I'm, I mean, the statement kids don't understand what they're feeling uh, was not exactly, I think, what I intended to say. And I, I, think, had, I had a feeling about that. I think it was yeah, one of those things where it's right. like, those things that we say yeah, then like when we um, explore we it further them understand what they're feeling right and just like uh, adults like until i until i grieved this and sat down and talked through it and understood it i didn't know what i was feeling right so it wasn't a matter of being a kid or being an adult it was a matter of addressing it and breaking it apart and deconstructing it so mm. you are absolutely correct and that's that's what we hope to do, right? Is to teach kids to figure that out for themselves, to kind of give them that, to give them the permission to make mistakes and permission to try and, and uh, not, maybe not succeed, but at least try and then figure out what step they, at what step things fell apart and then fix that step. And so that, that all goes together. Yeah. How do we teach kids? to learn? How do we teach them to learn about themselves? How do we teach them to mourn and grieve and understand that ADHD isn't their fault and that what other people do as a response to them is not their fault. So uh, when I tell you that this year has been incredibly life-changing, again, I don't think I can over-exaggerate that point. I really can't. I feel like I'm finally a (laughs) grown-up. Congratulations. Welcome. Yeah, it only you know, took me forty six years. You know, I mean, it's it, it's so I I I do have these moments where, uh, you know, we just uh, as, as you know we just moved and all these things. It's like wait, like when did I become an adult? Like it's you know it it's weird because there's this part of me that like still sort of views myself as kind of just like a <laughs> grew up goofball kind of kid, right? But like. I'm, I'm I'm not I mean maybe I'm a little bit of a goofball but um like it's a goofball adult there. right okay. right it's it, it's don't it's that I think part of uh the, just the things that have occurred in my life my own ADHD to that having a, a brain injury when I was 14 and having uh, severe disabilities as a result um it sort of taught me you know that in life really crappy things happen mm-hmm. for no particular reason just because sometimes randomness you know, the, uh, you know, the, the, you, you don't get a lucky roll. Right? right. And so you gotta, you know, play the, the cards that you gotta play the best hand you were dealt with, play it the best you can mm-hmm. and not to take life so seriously. Like, right. you know, because there's, there's a lot of serious stuff that, that happens in life. So we can't take ourselves so seriously. Right. It's otherwise it's, it's easy to get stuck in that place. And, you know, one of the things I was wondering, I know, um, like in when I've experienced any uh, any loss, um, I think part of my my ADHD brain, um, it my brain sort of gets stuck ruminating on losses. Maybe that's more than just ADHD. Um, but I'm wondering how that's been for you. I know it's only been a few days. You said. Yeah, it, it's um, well, it's been about a week, okay. and so there's been a lot of stages of it, but there's, you know, and there's other things going on too. It's interesting because, you know, I've had loss in my life before and I've had um, uh, traumatic experiences and the emotional dysregulation is um, very, it was, I didn't understand that it was an extreme reaction prior And I feel like having the awareness, uh, having the being medicated and being not only medicated for the ADHD, but for depression, which is something I've struggled with my whole life. And I've been, I was medicated for depression long before I was diagnosed and, um, having those tools and having the friends and tribe that also have ADHD and the kind of bounce off of them. Um, Hey, it, it's helped me to understand that I need to kind of pull back and look at things a piece of time and allow myself to feel what I feel. And, you know, I did something the other day that I have never done, which was I, I, I had gotten overwhelmed with the loss and with uh, some other situations. There were like three or four things in this past week that happened that just made it 
really crappy week. And I, I turned off all my communication. I turned off my phone. I turned off, uh, it was a big thing, the phone, internet, and just let myself be and mm-hmm. feel whatever it was that I needed to sort out and not have the outside influence of it. And the ability to take control like that felt amazing. The result of it was that I was able to get myself more regulated, I guess you can say, at least to understand that it's okay to feel what I felt and to that I'm not, I can't feel it all at once and I need to do a little at a time. And it's just been very, you know, it was very healing. I would have never done that in the past. In the past, it would have just been this overwhelming. Like, you know, the first couple of days, there was, you know, obsessive thinking about it, you know, interrupting everything I'm doing and whatever. But I also know parts of that is empathy, being a very uh, empathic person, which I think comes with ADHD. You can put yourself in other people's situations and I'm rambling, but basically I think that Yes, having ADHD, dealing with loss and dealing with things is more difficult because you get off on tangents in your brain and you're racing from one thing to another. But I think in awareness and in understanding some tools like writing things down and sorting them out, allowing yourself the time to to think or not pampering yourself, uh, calling my therapist and saying, can you get me in this week? You know, stuff like that really um, that awareness helped me do. So I am grateful for that. And again, some really, really, really good tribe ADHD years there for me, which was amazing. Mm. John, why don't we uh, take this moment to uh, take a, a quick break. And um, when we come back, can we lighten it up a little bit, maybe. Yeah. We can, we can lighten it up a little bit. Um, <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. So when we come back, we will, uh, I don't know. We'll, we will either, you know, go light and fluffy or we'll continue. Well, you know, when, when we come back, you'll, you'll be as surprised as we'll be when we come back. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) All right. This episode is brought to you by members of ADHD Rewired's coaching and accountability groups. This is David Jaffe and his coaching group story. Now I realize why you do the interviews. The interview is why I believe Rewired works. There's a process to it, of putting the right people together. I'm not alone. There's people just like me that all has helped me be more comfortable with who I am. I, I've learned a lot that I can only control myself. Change in behavior leads to habit, the little nuggets and all the activities. So I'm really just humbled to be able to be part of this group and be welcomed the way I feel like I've been welcomed. Because of this group, I I learned the importance of checking all existing commitments, making sure that they're on your calendar, all the recurring appointments because of the prompts that were provided during our planning sessions so that I don't commit to something I can't actually do and that I have to be mindful that it's my time. And that was very difficult for me. And I am on the right path because of this group and what I've learned through the many, many weeks together. It made a huge difference on my brain and how my brain thinks about time. Thanks, David Jaffe, for sharing your ADHD rewired coaching story. To learn more, go to coachingrewired.com. That's coachingrewired.com. Join us every second Tuesday of the month at 12.30 p.m. Central Time, that's 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 Eastern, for ADHD Rewired's live Q&A. And I just made signing up even more ADHD friendly. Go to erictivers.com slash events, and you can go there once and register for the next six to eight live Q&As all at one time. So sign up once, and you won't have to remember to register each time. You'll get automated email reminders, and it'll even save it to your online calendar. I'll be answering your questions live. You can ask them in the Q&A box on Zoom. And if you've always wanted to be on a podcast, you can ask your question live. Just make sure you're in a quiet location. To register, go to erictivers.com slash events. That's erictivers.com slash events.
I just wanted to uh, quickly share with everybody. You now we were talking about suicide here, and uh, in the U.S., if you uh, the the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, it's a twenty four hour call center. It's, uh, the number for that is eight hundred two seven three eight two five five. It appears they also have an online chat uh, function. So if you just Google suicide hotline, um, you'll also find that if you're in a different country, uh, every every country that I know of has their own uh, resource like that. Uh, remember that suicide is a symptom of a mental health disorder, and it is a very permanent solution to a very temporary problem. So uh, if you or someone you know is uh, uh, feeling suicidal, having suicidal thoughts, get help. Okay. Now that we've had our, our uh, public service announcement, let's, uh, let's come back. Okay. All right. And we are back with, Hello. with some light and fluffy stuff where we go on light and fluffy sure i mean i can let me let me end by saying this i i, do, I want to make sure that the message that everybody heard from what i said was not one of any condemnation or anything it is or to try to be trite about the tragedy that that happened um but i want to make sure that i help the people to see that that we're all different and we all handle life differently and we all need to feel and grieve and go through things the way we need to go through them. And if you're grieving and it feels overwhelming, it doesn't necessarily mean it's ADHD making it more overwhelming than it's not. It's just how you're dealing with it. And to remember that there are people, there are people that you can talk to even if you tell them, look, just listen, don't tell me anything. Don't try to tell me how I should handle this. How do, can you just let me listen? And that's how I made the realization about, about my fourth grade teacher was I was texting with a friend about, you know, what I was thinking and going through. And it dawned on me in that moment in mm. us texting. And it helps, it helps to have someone you trust who's nearby. And, you know, that's, I just want to make sure that I didn't, we didn't end talking about that without the honor and respect of the fact that we all mourn and uh, go through things in our own way. And it may or may not be ADHD and we might not know, but to honor that in yourself. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. And I think, you know, a, a theme that I'm really sort of uh, um, hearing in our conversation, uh, which is something that I've said on, on past episodes is this idea that um, we, we can't change the past. We can only change our understanding of the past. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. But I think it does, uh, it requires an openness and a vulnerability and a willing to sit with uncomfortable feelings and do that messy work uh, of, of growth. You know, it's uh, the more we try to run away from what's uncomfortable, like the more it follows us and it follows us with more stuff, right? It's, just because you know something doesn't make it true, right? Like, so I, as I said to you, I'd been very sick for several months and knowing what it, what it was didn't make it happen. It just gave me the information to try to find a solution to it. Mm -hmm. So the same thing, knowing what happened in our past, addressing what happened, being uncomfortable with it, it doesn't make it any more real or any more there. It just helps us to come to terms with it. And we're not going to do that for everything all at once. Things come up as we are able to deal with them or not. Right. And mm -hmm. so I'm certain that there's, so I'm certain there's going to be other things from my past that I'm going to go, Oh, I, it'll have to happen. I've got 46 years of past. Right. But at the onset to say, all right, this is going to suck. I don't know how this is going to work or where it's going to lead, but not facing it doesn't change it. I still got to do it. And that that's where I was last year with ADHD when when we did the the interview. I was at the spot of saying this sucks. I don't I don't want to deal with it. I don't want it to be true. I don't want to have the struggles that come along with it. But knowing it doesn't change it, right? So it's turned out to be one of the most one of the most amazing things that's happened to me in my journey and in understanding myself and in being more comfortable in my own skin. So 
you just don't know. So let me you ask don't you, know what you So so Jill, if um so over the past year you have this diagnosis now, what specific strategies are you now putting into place um uh over the last year that have been, have been helpful for you, including some, maybe some that you've even tried that maybe hasn't worked out so so great? Siri is my master. <laughs> so I have enabled Hey Siri for just about everything. And uh, understanding that putting my phone, I always used to joke around saying my phone was my second brain. Uh, Now it truly is an extension of my brain. And I always have everything in one spot. Mm -hmm. And I may driving and think about hear a song on the radio and be like, uh, I don't want to say, hey, Siri, right now, because she'll get upset and she'll answer me. But I might say to her, put this, you know, remind me to put this on my running playlist, or I might be thinking about something and say, you know, at uh, 5 PM, remind me to do this thing. Mm -hmm. And then I don't have to worry anymore about like that, repeating it to myself over and over again. And then later on going, what was that that I was repeating to myself over and over again? So how are you doing with checking in with those reminders? I set them so that they actually, I say a time when I want to remind me. Okay. Um, so, well, for the most part I do, I'll say things like it, it, if it's something like download this song, then when I go to make my playlist for running, I just look through my, you know, to-do list and, okay. and they're there. But uh, things that are like, I've learned because I was initially saying, oh, don't forget to make this doctor's appointment. Remind me to make this doctor's appointment or whatever. And then I didn't go look at the reminders. So that was the thing that I instituted was putting a time for it to remind me. Okay. Um, and what I like about reminders better than calendar events is that you can set the priority so high that it doesn't go off your screen until you actually physically go in and say, I did that. So mm. I've learned things about that. I've learned to use my phone also. Like I'll take pictures of things of everything. Yep. Again, if I just go and scroll through my pictures, I might find that thing that that I saw or that I was thinking of the other day, I, I started a, um, I'm starting on a new medication and there's a uh, program that you go into to try this new ADHD med. And on the, the program information packet, there's this number that you have to have for when you go to the pharmacy, when you go here, when you go there, and I just took out my camera and took a picture of it. And the psychiatrist said, what are you, what are you doing? I said, well, this way, when I need it, I it's in my phone. And she was like, that's brilliant. And go, you know, all of your patients will be doing that, but you know, so, <laughs> so the phone has become by, uh, it's just become an incredible tool for me. And, uh, do you ever use a uh, context reminder? So like, look at uh, reminders based on location. So remind me when I get here, remind me when I leave here. I do. Uh, I had to remember to go in though and turn on my location services because yeah. I had forgotten to do that and things weren't reminding me and I didn't know why, but yeah, I, I learned to do that as well. So I think that's probably been the best tool for me. I've also done a paper checklist, like at school when I was traveling between buildings, I had a checklist next to uh, my computer, all the things to remember to bring with me from one building to the other. So I would kind of go through the list and make sure I had it all. And, uh, you know, just things like that, like a lot of that, putting things down on paper or digitally has been, it helps with the effort yeah. tremendously. Yeah. So, um, have, uh, has, have things changed at all between, uh, you and your wife? Yeah, they've gotten a lot. I mean, they were great anyway. They're, she's, uh, she's a spectacular person. I'm not just saying that because she's my wife and, you know, because I have great taste. It's because (laughs) she just really is a uh, caring person and we love each other so much. Um, I saw, especially during my illness for several months, just the the dedication and devotion. And so, yeah, we've, you know, we just get closer all the time. Um, And it's been interesting because it helps her with some of the frustrations, right. To know where it's coming from. And then she can offer advice or we can work on how it might work together between us. Um, yeah, it's been really a good way for us to connect and she does not have ADHD. She is a very, um, 
thoughtful person in terms of she's very meticulous thinking and detail oriented and all those things. And sometimes, you know, like we're packing up something and I just throw everything in a bag and she's folding everything. You know, she used to want to go in and fold my stuff, right? Well, she knows now that that doesn't work for me. And so it doesn't, it's not helpful. And so it just helps to relieve a lot of that tension between us because Wait, she, it doesn't help you when she like folds your like laundry and stuff. I didn't say that uh, when we were packing, we're packing, oh, packing, packing. to go away. Right. So but clearly my brain like tuned out for like a, like a second. That's all it takes to miss a detail. <laughs> we keep a relatively, I mean, our, our house, if you walk through our house, you wouldn't know that I have ADHD and it's all because of her, but uh, I also, well, not all, she, all because of her, not because she does it all, but because the, um, the, the things that are important, I've come up with ways to make sure I do as well. And, um, you know, I still battle the mail monster, uh, the piling of the mail. mail. Like, it, why is mail so hard to just open? Like, like, I wish it just came pre-opened or everything was like just in a postcard. So it's like, you don't actually have to open mm-hmm. anything. Yep. That would be brilliant. <laughs> I think mail is unnecessary. And I don't know why companies spend money sending mail because I don't look at it. I don't. I look at if the envelope looks really important, then I'll open it. And that is, you know, like my car registration or, you know, things like that. There's a check in there. Mm-hmm. It ticks me off when it's really just a sweepstakes entry, but whatever. Yeah. Mail monster is difficult. So I did come up with some things with that. I did a, uh, just piling and paper monsters, you know, what'd you do for mail? Um, I have a bin that I put folders in and the folders are labeled, uh, it's not necessarily just mail. It's also any kind of papers that come in. And, And what was happening is I was, I had a few hospital admissions and every time I got out of the hospital, I was given this stack of papers and, uh, so I, I labeled the folders like health, uh, vehicle, household, things like that. And so, and it's right by the door. So when I would come in, when I come in with any papers like that, I put them in those folders. And so at the time I need them there, it's not extremely organized. It's not, you know, perfect, but it at least keeps it from being on the table and anything that's older than three months when i go into one of those folders for something anything that's older than three months that can be recycled just goes i don't worry about like it just it just goes it helps i you know i'm not it's not perfect but again one of the other big things i learned through my students was that when a process isn't working don't throw out the whole process like go back through it step by step figure out where it's not working and fix that component and that has been incredibly helpful for me and for my students because everything we try will have some piece that isn't perfect and if we just throw it out when it doesn't work we'll never end up with something and and i think it's really like it's that all or nothing thinking that a lot of people fall Mm -hmm. into of of like, oh, this, this, you know, to do this app or this process or this thing isn't working. So they completely abandon all parts of it. And so I'm encouraging listener uh, to, to do if there's if something that's not working for them. So they asking what is working, what's not working, really try to break, uh, break it apart because I am sure that there are parts of whatever process that maybe isn't really working for you, that there are parts that are. And so it's just often it's just uh, some tweaks that mm-hmm. can really make a big difference. That uh, became real to me with my students. Like I said, I we had uh, up until this year these paper agendas where you know it's a dated form of doing things, but it's a to do list that has dates on it. Is what it is. That's how, right. That's, that's why I look at those uh, those like agenda assignment notebooks, which I can't stand. But they also have where kids, if they need passes to go out in the hall, it has to be in there and stuff. And so if you have a kid with ADHD who doesn't remember theirs or they can't find theirs if they don't bring it with them then they're trapped in the room and they can't go out in the hall and if they forgot something in their locker and they need to go back and get and it becomes this pretty vicious cycle right and so in trying to help kids mitigate that you know started talking about not just okay what part of the process is it working literally going through their day so you get to school in the morning where is your agenda Okay. Do you agree? Yes. All right. Then when you get to class, do you write your assignments on the day? Yes. All right. Well, when you go home at night, do you look at those assignments? Well, no. Why? Because I left my agenda at school. All right. So there's the part that's not working, right? So and everything you- and everything that you're saying right now, 
Um, it like you can absolutely just context switch for for adults and say, okay, mm -hmm. so you wake up in the morning. Where's your calendar? You know, it's like you look mm -hmm. at your calendar. All right, so you get started with your day. I want you in the middle of your day. Like, are you checking your calendar to see where you're at in your day? Uh, are you at the end of the day? Are you doing a daily review to see all right what needs to get pushed to the next day? It's, so everything that you just said, it's like just change the context and it still applies. And that's why the phone works so much for me because I do look at my phone throughout the day and I do have it with me all the time and I am a little obsessed with it. So uh, admittedly, but in that works for me, but for some people that's too much, right? That's yeah. too much stimulation. That's too much, whatever. But that was how uh, we then realized that for some of the, the kids, this paper agenda isn't going to work from the onset. Like having this paper agenda doesn't work from the onset. And my, the school administration was wonderful that we let, they let those kids come up with their own agenda modification, whether it was a brand new one that they created, whether it was, and those students were able to implement their own, um, their own way, because frankly, what I told them was, I really want you to figure out what you're going to do when you get to high school or what you're going to do when you go to college or what, like, I, I personally don't care if you use this agenda, but the school does. So how can it's we so make silly. it? It's so well, silly. Well, it isn't, it isn't, Eric, because, you know. Are you disagreeing with me on my show? I am. I am. <laughs> I am. I think it's silly. I'm, I'm partially disagreeing. I think it's silly in that it's an outdated thing, right? Like people don't really use day planners like they used to. Some people do, right? Yeah. I believe that we got to prepare kids for the world that they're going to live in and the world they're going to live in is going to be one that uses electronic calendars and electronic pass systems or whatever. And it, and it probably will look like something that we haven't seen yet. Right. Because these are kids that aren't going to be in the work world for another 10 years, but we need to help prepare them for that. And how do you prepare them for that? You don't teach them just how to use one system. You teach them how to work with that system to make it work for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so, while the agendas are not ideal, helping those kids work through how to use them hopefully will help them work through how to use whatever incarnation of it or iteration of it is coming in their future. And I know like next year when my kids are in high school, they don't have the paper agendas, but they certainly will have more skills to be able to implement what it is that they use. And so I'm not disagreeing with you that they're silly in their form. They're outdated. I'm disagreeing with you that it's silly to try to help a kid become responsible about using something that's required. Right. And I might think. Yeah. I might think it's silly that a that a uh, an employer makes me punch a time card, but that doesn't mean don't do it. I got to figure out to remember to do it. The thought of that makes me shudder. Like, oh gosh, being an employee, I cannot. Yeah, I um. Worked but, in a grocery store when I was a kid, and that time clock. Every time I thought I was punching at the right time, I used to always get in trouble for punching like more than seven minutes off. And then I can never line it up correctly. You know what I'm talking about? When you have like, like the, those like those like tan like cardboard things that have like the lines on it, and it's like, oh, I was I went up, I went above the last thing. Like, oh no. <laughs> yeah, I don't think ours ours was a. It wasn't paper. It wasn't actually you. You would type your number in oh, okay. like your employee number and it would register it. So I didn't have that experience, but I do know that we had a seven minute over limit. And if we did anything more than seven, so I was, my shift was scheduled till 5 PM and I punched out at 508. They had to pay me till 530 and they would get, and, I, and it wasn't intentional. It was just, I couldn't get there at time. Now I know why. It took me 45 years to get diagnosed, but now I know why. <laughs> You can write, a, write a letter to them, your former employer. <laughs> Forget that I worked there, shall we? <laughs> where, where was it? Eric. Wegmans. What is that? <gasps> Wegmans? Everybody on the, in the Northeast Coast is shuddering right now. What's you Wegmans? don't know what is. Your life is... No, what's in, Wegmans? Wegmans is the uh, best place to grocery shop, best place to work. It was named the top place to work many years in a row. It is a, a grocery store with an experience. And it is, it, it's really unlike any other grocery store. It really is clean, nice. And they're opening up all over the place this year. They're like expanding into, they should be in your area soon. They're moving westward. Okay. Moving westward. 
Okay. Is it like a full service kind of grocery store or is it like, I, I, when I was, my first job, I worked at uh, uh, Sunset Foods, a couple of them in the area. It's, it's like a full service, like, it's almost strange that I think about it. Like, one of the, the roles that people would do there is they unload your shopping cart onto the conveyor belt for you. Yeah, no, that doesn't happen here. <laughs> Wagmans is just very, like, their produce, they get it all locally, so it's oh, nice. really fresh and and they have very vibrant like it feels very it has a really nice design inside and then you have like they have a coffee shop and they have a, a deli and they have a hot foods area where they have a sushi bar or they have like it's just this you go there and you can have lunch and you can shop for dinner i mean it's it's they have pre-prepared foods they have foods that are just ready that you just got to pop in the oven they have pizza they have subs it's it is um, and it's, it's local. It started in Rochester, New York. You know, from what you described about the store, it actually still does not make me want to go grocery shopping. Grocery shopping is horrible, isn't it? It's the worst. It's, <laughs> it is awful. The medication I take wears off right around 4 PM, right? When I take it before work, which is exactly the time I always find myself in the grocery store. And typically shopping for laundry detergent and i end up completely overwhelmed uh-huh. over fabric uh-huh. softener it's the silliest <laughs> thing it's just like wait a second it's fabric softener I, this is why i like trader joe's because you have like one option for every product and it's like fabric softener yes or no not what kind of fabric softener do you want in which size bottle in which sun uh, like, don't drink the fabric softener but yeah, I never realized how stressful grocery shopping was for me because uh, I used to just throw everything I wanted in the cart and then it's, you know, financial wasn't financially wasn't responsible and it can be overwhelming. And so we have cut out whatever grocery shopping we can. We have like delivery for nice. pet foods nice. and we do use uh, now for fabric softener and laundry detergent and dishwasher, we have this company that delivers these really green low waste yeah, things nice. and and so it's cut down on the grocery shopping a lot which you know now i also make sure i don't go at four o'clock <laughs> or when you're hungry which is like the worst time to go to a grocery store Even you know the- there was another thing i realized about being diagnosed was the connection between um impulsive eating and oh, ADHD. that was huge like that and i don't think i've ever really talked about that on the show is that like I mean, I used to, I used to be quite heavy. I mean, I, I, I think my heaviest, I weighed 250 pounds. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm six foot one. So, you know, now I'm, I'm like one. I'm more five. shocked that you're six foot one. Why, why is that? I, I guess I didn't imagine that. I don't know. Because every time I... you see me, I'm sitting and I'm on a screen and I'm like two inches tall to you probably. How tall do you think I am? Five, four. See, I'm five, eight. Ooh. So that's why. Okay, I, I only went low or shorter because the way you asked the question, I was like thinking that you probably thought that I thought you were taller. So I went shorter. You were no, just thinking. I was, just, I was I overthinking was, yeah. that one. It's easy yeah. to do though. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but go on. I'm sorry. You were, you were. Yeah. So I, so I mean, I, when I, I remember when I first started taking Adderall, I realized like it made me very aware of how much I just like was eating because I was bored. Like, and, and cause I know that when I, like when, when my Adderall wears off in the evening, it's like, you know, it's why we can't keep junk food in, in the house. It's because it's like, it, it's just like, I'm ravenous. Right. And, uh, so I, you know, but I have, you know, I haven't shared this. I have cut out my granola. I haven't had, and part of it was cause I realized that I have a, a, a uh, allergy to anything that has corn in it, which if you you haven't looked at a, a, a ingredients on any like food product lately, like everything has corn in it. So it sort of limits <laughs> what I can eat, but I have felt so much better since cutting that out. Um, I think I updated that, uh, talked about that a while back on, on the show. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, it's one of these weird things that, uh, that I learned that I, uh, my mom actually told me after uh, she's like, well, yeah, when you were a kid, you had, a, you were allergic to corn and we had to get all these things. I'm like, wait, really? Like, you know, I have like all these like digestive issues. Like, why didn't you tell me this until now? Right. And so I've, I've cut it out and it's like, oh, my stomach aches have went away. Yeah. It's awesome. Is- like, it sucks that like, I can't 
like I have to restrict a lot of what I eat, but it's, I'd rather not have stomach aches. I am allergic to wheat. I get it. Uh-huh. I get it. And it, it is, um, you know, I, I have people who be like, Oh, just a little. And like, you know, it, right. it's like, you don't get it. <laughs> it's a genuine allergy, like a bloating whole thing. And it's the, consequences of having that piece of cake are not worth it to me. And, and, but I will say, you know, back to what we were saying about that. I, I don't know how much of it is boredom. Um, for me, it feels like the impulsiveness, impulsivity, whichever is the correct word, because I, I spent my whole life, uh, I've struggled with my weight my whole life. And I, uh, spent a, a good portion of my life waking up in the morning saying today I'm going to eat this for lunch, this for breakfast, this for tomorrow night order, but and and I'm going to be good mm-hmm. quote unquote. And all of a sudden the bag of jelly beans is gone and I don't even, it was an impulsive thing. It was whatever. And then you get down on yourself and then you, where I can think at like now going, I'm hungry is it truly hunger or, and I can actually think about it mm-hmm. as opposed to doing it mindlessly, seemingly mindlessly. Um, it's certainly not perfect, but has made a considerable difference. I mean, I've lost a significant amount of weight and uh, have become, went from being a couch potato to being a runner and um, an active person and loving it. And, uh, so you learning went from being a couch lot. potato to a tater tot. Because, like, you're totting along. Oh, that was bad. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get it at first. So it was, it was, it was funny in my that. head. You know, yeah. this is what yeah. happens a lot. It's, um, you know, I, I, it's okay. I swing and miss a lot. It's okay. It's okay. It's like we said, it's, you're trying. And I think <laughs> once you explained it, it actually was kind of funny. I just, at that point, had already made, like, at that point, because in my head, I, like I pictured this tater tot with like a headband on and like a running, like that was that was in my head. And you know, it is still kind of like that, you know, square body type that I have. So yeah, that was <laughs> a little um, hanging out of the side. So, so let, let, let me ask you this. Um, you know, a, a year ago you were diagnosed and you were just starting to explore this. Are there any things that you are surprised by a year uh, a, a year later? Um, that you didn't expect? Oh, all of it. All of it. Because I didn't, I mean, I didn't even have a clue that this diagnosis was there. I wasn't one of those people who went saying, do I have ADHD? I was one of those people who they said, this kind of sounds like ADHD. And I, I no, you're not right. This is wrong. So everything surprised me about it. Like the quite literally everything. The best part about it, um, besides the self-awareness and you know those those personal things, I, the people I have met and the people who have understand me, you know, you have become a friend, and I I know that uh, there have been times when we can just you know n- talk. Like there was one night we we were chatting and both of our medications had worn off and. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't judgment. There was awareness that each other's meds had worn up, but there wasn't judgment in it, you know, and there was just awareness of it. And um, I, I'm, I, uh, Jessica from How to ADHD mm-hmm. is a dear friend. I know she's she, been a good friend to you. She's been a very good friend to me. And she um, has been there for me through a lot of this really crappy past couple of months. And understanding just that it's okay to be overwhelmed, that it's, it was uh, okay. Just understanding where I was coming from as a person with ADHD mm-hmm. and she's just a great person, but though that support through those things, um, that friendship, that understanding the potential for the rejection sensitive dysphoria when you're friends with someone and then understand like, what do you need so that that doesn't feel that way. And how do we check in and just tremendous, tremendous thing. And, uh, shocking. I didn't, I didn't expect to, when you feel your whole life that you're different and that you're not, uh, that you're out of place, you don't expect to find an entire community of people who understand you. Like, 
That's the yes. power of community right there. It is that powerful. It is that meaningful. It's, um, I think in a lot of ways, it's sort of the glue that holds me together. <laughs> and I think a lot of people to know that we're not alone and like we can have those days that were just a big hot mess and like, it's okay. It's absolutely okay. Cause we'll, we'll get through it and we don't have to get, we don't have to get through it alone either. Like we can reach out for support and a support that is not judgmental, that is there because you get it. Because you get right, we do. Me too. And, and because, you know, and, and just like any community, there are going to be people who are not like me, right? Like I'm going to meet people and be like, all right, yes, they have ADHD as well, but we don't, you know, we have different interests. We have different, and that's okay too. We don't have to, you know, be kumbaya because we all have ADHD. But even those people that I might not necessarily share a lot of common life experiences with it. I can understand and they can understand me and they share experiences that then I relate to. And it has been just fulfilling on so many levels to be able to help each other and to build this community. And I, I look forward to a day when our community has elevated the awareness of, of, of what, of how we live <laughs> and what the filter that we have to see life, that we see life through and how it functions, that we have gotten to a place where the world becomes more ADHD friendly for us. So that at the very least we can find each other more easily and understand better and the work that you're doing. And I mean, that encourages me to want to find a way to, to be able to do that on a bigger scale with, with, kids and teachers in school districts and you know and to be able to say 10 years from now or whatever and look back and go wow look how much has changed and you know look what we've done for the next generation and i i see some incredibly kind-hearted people doing that right now i'd like to nominate uh joe void for secretary of education can can i rep okay <laughs> going to talk about you know for, for president for, i don't know but um i am going to hold up my uh my timer which i'm so sad oh, like, you're high-fiving yeah me. It's, okay. it's, it's a stop timer and i'm so sad because this was my favorite timer because of the feature that it used to have in the middle of this hand that's telling you to stop it used to tell you how long it's been since you should have stopped and he did this update and i'm just so sad i'm gonna write him because he actually he brought this app back on to the app store because he uh because I told him I wrote a review about it like two years ago and like then he couldn't find it. And I told him like I just wrote a review, it's gonna be in an attitude magazine. So he actually like re-released like the same version of it just to put it back up. Cause but oh, I'm so sad about this update. But um I think we should end there before we go down far down our rabbit hole. And uh Joe, thanks for coming back on. Uh maybe we should do this again in a year. It's like my my annual visit. Yes, yeah, so you'll have your annual check up on Eddie at January Wired. <laughs> Be like 87 years old, like, ass ah, Eric. Uh, <laughs> not Eric. Hey, Wire episode 4004. Like, what, what? What was that? <laughs> <laughs> like, Eric, Eric, nobody uses the internet anymore. I now have that chip implanted in their brain. <laughs> Podcasts, like, those were, those were so, you know, 2017. <laughs> so 2017, Eric. Get All right. the time. How can people uh, reach you if you want to be reached? Probably the easiest way I uh, would be, I have a YouTube channel called Adult Onset Runner, which is about people cool. starting running in life like I did. Thank you. I haven't updated it since my illness. Uh, it'll be getting updated again soon. So anyhow, Adult Onset Runner at gmail.com is the best way to get in touch with me. And um, what I'd love to hear from is um, anyone who, got questions about you know schools and stuff but other teachers who uh or administrators who want to um maybe find ways to work together to bring our message to the bigger um to the bigger community and and strength in numbers like we said so please do reach out to me i appreciate it thank you so much joe thank you eric thanks for all that you do absolutely well we'll talk again soon okay ciao This is Eric Tibbers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it. 
to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find summaries and additional resources for each episode. Learn more about the ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group and sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content that you won't get anywhere else. It's all at ADHDrewired.com. Support ADHD Rewired and help replenish our coaching group scholarship fund by becoming a monthly patron at patreon.com slash ADHD Rewired. Different levels of support get different perks. You can give just a buck or three or five bucks a month or more. Every little bit helps. And it's an awesome way for you to let me know that you value this show the community, and everything else we do. That's patreon.com slash ADHD Rewired. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tivers. Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube to see select interviews and other videos I've made. The ADHD Rewired community is now a secret group on Facebook, so that's one less reason to not just be a passive listener, but to be an active member of our community. Fill out our short screening form at our website, ADHDrewired.com. We screen everyone before they join. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities or on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, Quora, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, your family, your clients, as well as your coaches, therapists, and doctors. If you're a member of Chad or any other ADHD support group, be sure to tell them about this podcast. You can even show them how to download it on their phone or even do it for them. And if you really love this episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I count on you to help me spread the message. One of the biggest things you really can do to support this podcast and to help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on the Apple Podcast app or on Stitcher or any other podcast app that supports and accepts ratings and reviews. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Need some ideas on where to start other than Brene Brown's Gifts of Imperfection, Darren Greatly, Rising Strong, or her six-hour recorded workshop, The Power of Vulnerability? Then I would recommend The One Thing by Gary Keeler. Oh, and if you by any chance know Brene Brown, please let her know how grateful I am for all of her work and what she means to me and the ADHD community, and that she's welcome on my show anytime. And in the one in like 7 billion chance that Brene, you're listening, please come and be a guest. Thanks. This is Eric Tivers reminding you, keep learning, keep growing, and keep connecting. And no matter how hard it all feels, Remember, we can do hard things. Until next time.